so let's get started. So today we're going to cover sort of how to prioritize different messages, a bit about writing for the web, which should apply to probably everything you do really, and some design tips from Shania. So I think a lot of this on reflection after the thing yesterday will be a little bit of a recap, but I think that's probably good. Um, I think it's good to hear the same things over and over and over again, <laughs> but some of it should be new. So let's start off with um, prioritizing messages. So, oh, sorry. Let's rethink about, to begin with again, this is something covered yesterday, like why do we communicate? Why do we bother? A lot of it is because we want to form connections. We want to tell people who aren't involved with what we do, what we're doing, and we want to strengthen the connections of uh, the people who are already in our networks. Um, and ultimately it's because we want those people to do something. So we want them to click on our um, uh, new publication or join our event. Um, the, the point of communicating is something is usually because you want someone to do something about it. Um, and I've put experiment in here because I think this is really crucial. It's always good to experiment and try new things um, within, uh, <laughs> within reason, <laughs> obviously with them um, in terms of, you know, the branding and the messaging and what the point is of doing the communication but everything on social media is very short-lived no one is going to remember if something that you try falls flat on its face so it's well worth experimenting and trying something new um, and you know there's very little consequence in trying to be innovative um, so let's talk a bit now about audiences um, i've put the top here don't be afraid to ask for help because Finding new people to communicate to can often be quite challenging. It often feels like you're sort of preaching to the choir. You're already telling everyone who knows all about you more about you. Um, but we have here a really good network. Every different node in Elixir has got its own little network and people that they can spread the message to. Um, so it's well worth making use of those. And I've highlighted some here. So for internal communications, obviously a lot of the things we do, we wanna just communicate to people within Elixir. So the mailing lists here are really useful. There are loads at Elixir. So whether it's for a specific community or platform um, or for the Elixir comms mailing list, which I've put at the bottom there, um, we have a, a wealth of those. And also we can create new mailing lists where there's demand. Um, we will obviously evaluate those. We don't just create them all the time willy nilly, but um, if there's something that you think would be a useful network to have, then, then we can look into that. We obviously have the internal newsletters um, alongside external newsletters, which um, individual nodes may have. We also have the industry newsletter, which goes out to people who are not within Elixir. Um, the internal ones being obviously, you know, the, the weekly brief um, is the main one. Um, another internal place you can share things, which I'm not sure everyone's aware of necessarily, is our monthly program teleconferences. So this is where everyone in Elixir come, or representatives from all the platforms, communities and work package leads for the Converge project all come together once a month to discuss everything that they've been doing, everything they plan to do and where they need help. So this is really good if you want to find out about what's going on in Elixir, but also if you want to broadcast a message to the rest of Elixir as well. So definitely make use of that. Uh, I've put the Alexia Commons industry and impact slack in there as well. I think Shin is going to talk a bit more about that later because um, I think there are some changes coming up to that. But again, that along with the mailing list is where you can sort of say, OK, I've got this event coming up. We need more people registered. Share it on there and we'll, we'll all do our bit to, to help promote that. OK, so I wanted to touch on a bit about social media. So we had these discussions a lot yesterday. I'm thinking that probably everyone is using uh, Twitter and also possibly LinkedIn, either professionally or, or, or personally. So I'm going to focus on those. I think Facebook and um, Instagram are probably a little bit out of the realm of Elixir, but if you think you've got a use case for it, then I definitely encourage you to, to engage with that because um, certainly the reach of Facebook, Instagram and YouTube is so much higher than, than we have for LinkedIn and Twitter but it's whether the audience is there. And I think these are the most popular ones for science. Um, so for both of these, definitely research the people or institutes and tag. I think the two most popular tweets we've ever done from Elixir have been the all hands group photo and the biohackathon group photo. So people really enjoy the emotional connection and they like seeing their own picture um, <laughs> on the internet. So it's well worth adding a personal connection to the things that you do. People, that really resonates with people, especially through LinkedIn, where you, 
you, p- pretty much everyone has a profile and you can tag people um, within that and they like to show because it's their professional site what they're doing as well so definitely go ahead and do that um, create visuals to custom sizes so if you are creating visuals obviously you put a lot of effort into them and you don't want them to be cropped or stretched or distorted and each platform has its own special sizes and I've cl- there's going to be a slide at the end with useful links um, and resources where I've put a, a sort of cheat sheet for that so you can find all the different um, custom sizes for Twitter or LinkedIn or um, wherever. Um, always have something to click. It's come back to the whole point of doing things. You want people to engage with what you're doing. So you need to have something clickable. Um, emojis in moderation are very useful and can help draw attention to the points that you need. Obviously, something that's just completely every other word as an emoji is a bit too much, but they can really help direct the attention um, to, to the important information. Um, Twitter obviously has sort of a, a short uh number of characters so you only want the key information but that kind of even though LinkedIn has a lot more space it's still important to keep that in mind because people only see the preview so you really want the short summary sentence like the conclusion of what you're saying to be at the top and then further information down if they they want to find it out and that's true as well for the hashtags if adding hashtags to LinkedIn helps the sort of search engine optimization or recommendations for what people are interested in what they've clicked on before. So it will come up in their news feed. So it's quite useful to add the hashtags and you can just put those at the bottom. Um, I've said that in Twitter, like no more than three hashtags, probably certainly within the text because it really affects the readability of what you've got and what you're you're reading there. Um, But these are just suggestions you'll see in a lot of things that we put out. We don't always stick to these rules. So, um, but it's just, the way to do it sort of optimally. Um, I should say, if anyone has any points that they want to to raise hands or contribute to the conversation, you can interrupt me at any time. Um, I'm just sort of plowing through because we'll have a discussion at the end. But if anything comes up that you think is relevant to say, then please do interrupt. Um, we talked a lot about yesterday about planning that came up in both Radhika and Marie's talk. So having a content calendar can be very helpful, specific, like especially if you have a campaign, something's being launched or you have an event coming up, you want to make sure that you're sort of promoting that regularly so it doesn't get lost within everything else. Um, So having a calendar can be very useful and obviously there are paid for ones, there are free ones, um, which will schedule and send out the tweets as well. But there are also ones which have, you know, a template where you can download and just create that internally and then you can share it with people so you can just at least tell them what you're planning on doing and then manually uh, um, put that out there. And again, these are listed in the resource slide at the end of the presentation as well. Um, Pre-writing the content can always be good. I'm very guilty of putting a tweet out and forgetting some of the crucial information. So I like having it all written down and just copy pasting and making sure that it's all going to work and sometimes you need someone to check over that and sign off um particularly if you want to tag certain people if it's external people at a conference it's well worth running things past them to make sure that they're happy with what you've put out there and that comes on to the, the bottom one as well make sure that you have found all the relevant people and places that are involved in the event or the launch of whatever or the publication just so that they're tagged in it again it gives that personal um uh, touch but also if you're live tweeting something at a conference, it's really useful to have all the relevant people there listed. So you don't have to be like, oh, what was that person's uh, Twitter tag? Because it's not always very logical what people have either. So I always find that you're useful to have um, there. Um, I've put in an example here that we look at as well. This is one of Shania's ones from last year, the Bioinformatics Industry Forum. Didn't actually ask her permission to share this, so I hope it's okay. <laughs> but it's very nice, so she should be very proud of it. So this is just a, a document where um, she's included all of the different um, graphics and the text that she includes to uh, intends to to put out. And this is shared with everyone within the hub and and whatnot. But you can also see, you know, oh, it's done in the weekly brief for this week. This is the text, and you can see how. the the style differs between what's within the weekly brief and what's on Twitter. And again, like we were mentioning, you know, it's useful to use emojis in the right place. So, you know, calendars, clocks, little exclamation marks to say, quick, do something about this. It's always very useful. Um, So that was just one example. Oh, here we go. Um, 
Okay, on, on that note, I'm going to move on to newsletters as a little segue. Um, I've put two pictures up here. I think newsletters really should be more signpost than newspaper. They should, uh, as Marie mentioned yesterday in her talk, you know, you should have all the content that you need for your newsletter already. And what you're doing in the newsletter is just, you know, putting links to, to where people can find out more information. So just really prioritize and, and, and uh, put in links to, to direct people rather than a lot of information. Um, which is what I'll say here. So um, I think it's something like only 20% of anything on the web is ever read. So it's always the stuff at the top and then people don't bother with anything at the bottom unless they know there's something good down there. So really put all the content that you want to be right at the top um, and make it look quite interesting um, so that people you know, we'll see what you actually want them to see. Um, I think everyone does this already, but it's really important to just chop, chop, chop. A lot of people send in quite a lot of information and you only really need, you know, title, date, summary sentence and a link. Um, so really do be quite brutal. Um, and this final point, divide and conquer, is to really think about where things should go um, and pop them in the correct sections. Once people become familiar with a newsletter, they'll know what comes in different sections. So maybe the plant community will know that there's a section on the plant community lower down. So they just check that and, and then they leave. You know, people, once they're familiar with it, will find where the content is. Um, and, you know, similar to that, don't be afraid to create new sections. I think we previously had a tip of the week in the newsletter that wasn't very popular, so we axed it. And then Shenya decided that people were actually quite interested in reading publications that came from Elixir. So now we have a recommended read section and that's really popular. So, you know, nothing is ever static. You can do changes, certainly. So I think that's um, an interesting development in our... Um, weekly brief at least. And here's just an example of kind of some things that were sent. So this is a document that is populated by the training platform and they just paste in all the things that are coming up that they want us to um, share. And it would be very easy just to, you know, copy and paste parts of this and put it all in the training platform, but some things require a bit more space and other things just can go in our event section at the bottom. Um, but this, this event, obviously they've pasted in a lot from the event description, but um, it is relevant to highlight, you know, who's running this, it's part of us, it's part of um, these related um, people, uh, related organisations organising it, so it's important to kind of capture some of that information to entice people in, and then we have the, just the link at the bottom here. Um, speaking of... Um, oh, yeah, okay, no, that's the next slide, sorry. Um, when you're writing things, uh, I don't know if anyone's aware, but we do actually have a style guide, um, something that I was not strictly aware of <laughs> that long ago. Um, so it's just got some sort of key points about writing for the web um, within an Elixir context. Um, it's got some sort of style guides for Elixir specific terms and just generally a few bits and bobs about how we like to present things like dates um, or headings, you know, um, in terms of capitalization and things like that. So I think that's a useful resource, oh, back again. Um, and if you're interested in, in more detailed writing conventions, I use this resource loads. It's from the University of Oxford. So I don't know, we're in Cambridge, but we do like to sometimes use things from Oxford. <laughs> it's not that um, much of a rivalry. Um, and this just has loads of information about, you know, different types of punctuation, what the accepted ways to write dates and times, um spellings and and you know how to use titles properly as well so i find this super useful um it's very nicely laid out and easy to see so um just in case anyone's interested in that I keep doing this um so yeah just some common mistakes so using like th and sis and things at the end of a date so 25 may not 25th 24 hour clock so i think the states they always use this 2 10 p.m. but in the Europe tend to use this sort of 24 hour clock and capitalization so those are the, the main the main things that I see popping up. Um, I think I've deleted one of my slides about accessibility which is quite a crucial one maybe we'll find it later on <laughs> um, we can come back to it. Um, so uh, I want to move now to talk about news releases that we were talking about um, writing. So I think a lot of us have come back from have come into 
to this role from from a scientific background where it's really necessary when you're writing an article or it's just standard practice to give a load of background and context really broad scale thing and they get more specific and then talk about what's new right at the end to your results and um, uh, the implications of that but for news releases and journalism you really want to turn it on on the head so like I said people only really read the first first section of anything to decide whether it's worth their time to scroll down so you really want to put the conclusion and the hard-hitting things right at the beginning and then talk about you know um who was involved add some quotes then look up you know background like who was um what resources are involved in this here's a link to find out more um you can email us to find out all this so all that's sort of going to the bottom so really the first sentence should be purely conclusion and then building on that um I know on titles as well, if you go to any news website, you'll see that the titles of the news reports are typically around five words long and really very rarely longer than that. Um, and that's because, you know, you need to draw people in and it needs to be short and punchy and it's important for search engine optimization and things like that, where um, you get the crucial information in the title. The same is sort of true for news releases as well and i know that we're very guilty of putting out quite long ones um and that's something we're trying to work on now more science less uh text <laughs> um to shorten those um quotes are super important in news releases um but they should be used to sort of embellish and back up your points rather than form the sort of bulk of the narration of the of the story so you know you should make a point saying Oh, everybody loved this event and then a quote of someone saying i love this event um and to to embellish and crucially you're always trying to answer this who what why where and when um in your news releases so that should really drive you know what's happening and all of that can be fit in, into to one summary sentence at the beginning uh, if you're clever about it oh here's my slide on accessibility it wasn't where i thought it was um so this is quite important and um something that uh, web developer Martin is always um, banging on about. So the use of built-in formatting um, is really important. It's sort of a temptation to say, oh, I want you know the heading to be bold and a bigger font, so you just change it. But for screen reading purposes, it's really important to use the headings in the right order um, so that you know for the screen readers, they can then format that properly. Um, adding captions to images is always important as well, and this shouldn't be just, say, you know, photo of people, it should be a bit more detailed, um, and you can find some more information on that in this link at the bottom here, which I think is quite useful. Um, and links and underlining, so again, this is to do with built-in formatting, it's useful to have a link that's informative, so saying rather than just click here and just have a link, you should say click to view the Elixir branding guidelines and have that underlined, and then this um uh two little arrows here i'm not entirely sure what it's called but we've started adding that i'm sure you've seen to our um newsletters to indicate that this is actually a link that people should click and go to um and similarly having um if i just go back here a lot of these things that we get sent have multiple links throughout and it's really important because you're trying to direct people to go to a resource or, or something and that's often something that you track for your analytics you really only want the one link um for people to click on otherwise people are you know not sure where to go or, or whatnot so summarizing that is also really useful and here you can see those little um i think like rack squo or something i can't remember maybe shenya knows um yeah little arrows to indicate that it's a link <laughs> 